Thank you, Stephen, and well, good morning and good afternoon, wherever you might be from my side as well. Um, a very interesting topic today, a fascinating one, in fact, and that is 5G antenna design for mobile phones. And um, before I start, though, I'd like to thank my colleagues um, listed below and also some of our customers from Sony Mobile Communications who have kindly um, made a contribution to the, to the presentation today as well. So let's start. Um, and... You know, we, we, we read a lot about 5G every day in the media. The first smartphones supporting 5G are expected on the market in 2019. But what is actually this promise of 5G? Well, it boils down to two things. Firstly, higher, higher speed high, for high data rate communication. Secondly, low latency for real-time interaction. So that's the horizontal and the vertical axes shown here. And what 5G adds in addition to the application shown here, or what it enables, is things like autonomous driving, things like aug augmented or virtual reality interaction, a tactile internet, which has applications in fields ranging from industry automation to transport systems to healthcare education and gaming. So our focus today is on the mobile phone. And to start this discussion about antenna design, of course, we first need a model, a CAD model, um, which was actually designed by one of my colleagues in Dassault System using the CATIA tools on our 3D experience platform. And in order to actually uh, run any simulations or do any antenna design work, we need to convert this to a CST Studio Suite model. And this can be done using the Power By link, which um, uh, is, is also available on our, on our platform. But let's have a bit of a closer look at the phone. So it's somewhat detailed, though of course far from realistic complexity, but we do have a, a metal frame, different configurations of the housing, so it could be aluminium or glass or plastic, depending on what we're interested in studying. It has a multi-layered glass screen. It also contains a number of parts and modules, cameras, for example, wireless charging units and so on. And it's also got a somewhat realistic PCB design and connector. What it lacks is the antennas but we have got some space for the antennas. So we're looking at two frequency ranges today. I'll, I'll come back to this in the overview of the talk in a few minutes time. But essentially in frequency range one, what we mean is the sub six gigahertz frequency range, we were kind of doing traditional antenna design. So the same as you do for wireless LAN, for 3G, 4G or Bluetooth type antennas. The challenge here always is space. How do we fit an antenna that is meant to radiate in a frequency range at which the wavelengths are large compared to the phone, or relatively large compared to the phone, how can we integrate and design and integrate antennas into the limited available space that we have? Um, and the, the KPIs, so the key performance indicators that we're interested in here, or in, in this range, are the, the standard quantities like the total radiated power, the total isotropic sensitivity, specific absorption rate. Now, what we also have, and which is uh, you know, a bit of a longer term vision for, for phones, is to support um, the 5G frequency range too. This is the millimeter wave um, frequency range. So roughly around 28, well, 26 to 40 gigahertz is, is one of the ranges of interest. Um, and here the antennas are going to be, um, well, chip integrated probably. And they're going, to cons they're going to be small arrays. So typically they'd be consisting of four elements in a one by four or two by two configuration. And the challenge here, because we have this, these antenna modules that we could be designing, but primarily we're gonna be, the challenge is how to integrate these behind um, the housing of the phone so that it still works. And what works means we'll get to later. Here we've got different key performance indicators. So we've got the eff effect of isotropic radiated power. We've got the cumulative distribution function and power flow when it comes to human um, safety compliance modeling. So we'll address all of these things during the course of this talk. Now, there are a lot of frequency range definitions for the various regions around the world. But for the, and I don't want to go into all the details of this. We, you know, you, you can do a lot of research about which frequency bands to support in which regions. Um, for the purposes of this webinar, we're going to focus on part of the N78 band in frequency range one. So that's the 3.4 to 3.8 gigahertz band. This will be used in Europe and parts of Asia, as will um, parts of the N257 and N258 bands in frequency range two. So roughly 25.5 to 29.5 gigahertz is going to be our focus for today. But of course, the principle that we're going to discuss, 
apply just as readily to all the other frequency ranges which are used in other parts of the world. So there are two challenges that are going to play, yeah, which, which, which we'd like to discuss the implications of today when it comes to antenna design. The first is model complexity. So even for our relatively um, complex model, which is nowhere near a, a real phone, you can see that there are quite a lot of parts and there are a lot of details which could lead to an extremely, um, let's say, numerically expensive simulation if we don't simplify the model. We also have the effects on the human body, which we have to take into account. You know, there are safety considerations. So how hot is your head getting when you're using your mobile phone? Is, there, is it hot enough to cause cell damage? Um, and what's the effect on coverage? So you know, does your mobile phone have enough antennas in the correct places to provide good coverage in typical user um, or usage scenarios? And the question is, on the left, how much can we simplify? and still get results from our simulations that are going to be usable in actual product design? What happens if we oversimplify? The second question is, and, and, this, and it applies especially at the higher millimeter wave frequencies, how do we even model a body the size of, you know, well, 1.7 meters or 1.8 meters? How do we model this at 28 gigahertz? when there's a dielectric constant of about 40 to be taken into account, this becomes an electrically huge um, structure. And this is quite challenging as well, especially given the complexity of the phone that is to be modeled in its vicinity. Right, so that was the introduction. Um, and I'd like to now um, just kind of introduce briefly what the structure is going to be. We're first going to talk about antenna design in the sub six gigahertz band. Then we're going to go over to the millimeter wave band and finally to talking about uh, modeling antennas in the proximity of the human body. So human exposure certification in particular. So let's start at, at the sub six gigahertz band. And the key point here is really that 5G so and, and and the sub six gigahertz band is is our is our first point port of call really, because initially um, mobile devices will use well, the, the first mobile phones that are five G compatible will be supporting this frequency band. Um, 5G will not be used on its own initially, but it'll be used in conjunction with other standards like 4G, like Wi-Fi. Um, and the, the, the kind of the higher millimeter wave frequencies will initially only be used for fixed broadband links. Though in the future, of course, we'll see these integrated into phones as well. So this is an interesting topic for this, for this presentation as well. Now, I, you know, the, the people who are attending this presentation are not only expert antenna designers, um, but you might, might well be here um, for just to inform yourself for interest as well. And um, so I'd like to, you know, a perfectly valid question that you might ask is, well, you know, I have a phone, a previous generation mobile phone with a bunch of antennas that work quite well at um, existing standards. Can't I just reuse these in my new phone? You know, why, why can't I just take them, put them in a new phone and hope that they'll work? Well, there are certain challenges here. First of all, they are not going to fit properly because the internal geometry is quite different. They might well overlap with other components. If we could move them, they still might not fit quite, quite right. Um, and of course, we'd have to have new matching networks for all of them as well which might or might not fit into the phone. Even if we could fit them, the performance is going to be changed entirely. And the reason is, and that's something we're going to go into in, in more detail shortly, is that the, the, what's radiating is not just the antenna, but the antenna in conjunction with the phone itself. So the internal geometry of the phone has a very strong influence on antenna performance. Um, and the, 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 the short answer is no, we cannot just reuse antennas. Antennas in every case have to be customized for the particular device that you're wanting to design them for. So let's see how much space we have for our antennas in this device. So we've got two kind of regions. The first is the, let's call it the main available space, which is marked sort of a weird brownie color. Um, it's quite a shallow space, about two millimeters of depth, but a lot of planar area. And then we've got the, some strips along the edge as well, which has a bit more depth, five millimeters, but is quite narrow. So it also is a, a five millimeter width. Okay, but so there's, there's some available space. And let's try and find some antenna candidates or some antenna options which might fit into these spaces now. So we have, for example, or, 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 one tool that we can use in order to find 
candidates is antenna magus, of course. So we, we always talk about antenna magus when it comes to antenna design, and this um, talk is going to be no exception. And the idea here is not to find antennas that are going to work, definitely. It's to find candidate designs which might show promise in the frequency range of interest and might have kind of the right form factor in order to be integrable in our device. So Antenna Magus is a quick way to get starting designs, which can then be used in the actual hard work of designing the antenna for the phone, right? So when, when there's no claim at all that the designs that you're going to get out of Antenna Magus are instantly um, going to work. It's giving you starting points, which you can use uh, um, to do the further design work with. So let's have a look at this one. This looks like it might fit quite nicely along the side strips of the, of the phone, and it might work quite nicely at the wireless LAN frequency. So let's position it. In fact, let's position it at several different locations. So there are five different places that we're looking at this. And in two of those, positions one and two, the antenna seems to work quite nicely in the frequency bands of interest. If I just grab my laser pointer, you can see that one of the one of the regions is here, so that works quite well. And one another one is over here. But you can see even at this, at the 5.5 gigahertz frequency range, um, you're gonna need slightly different configurations of that antenna because the behavior is different depending on the exact position. And in fact, even this combination of antenna one and two, it, it works if the, both of those antennas are in exactly those positions. If you move one of them, the other one also stops working as well. Okay, so we're not just looking at single antenna placement, but multiple antenna placement. If we then go over to the other three, we can see that here, these aren't working at all in the frequency bands of interest, despite being ostensibly pretty much the same design. Why is this? Well, this is a, a well-known problem or well-known phenomenon in, in mobile phone antenna design. Essentially, the antennas are not actually radiating on their own. They're exciting structural resonances of the phone. So it's that interaction, the beneficial interaction between the antenna and the phone. This is what we're actually engineering. It's quite nice to visualize and it's quite useful to visualize as well. And what, what becomes very clear is that modeling the geometry of the phone is crucial. And that actually directly answers one of our questions of how much we can simplify the model. Perhaps we want to do this to get faster simulation times, but is it actually valid to do? Well, let's have a look at a very simple example. In this case, we have our battery and we model um, the connection, the power connection between the battery and the motherboard, that kind of is connected or disconnected, the green or the red curves. You can see making that tiny little change has quite a dramatic effect on the matching behavior or the matching performance of the antenna. You get some, when you disconnect this, you get some, you know, you might be tempted to think, well, wow, here's a resonance that I can exploit. But actually, as soon as you connect, <laughs> make that connection between the battery and the motherboard, that resonance is suppressed. So it's not a real, um, it's not a real phenomenon in your phone. Other resonances, might be shifted when you disconnect or disconnect the thing. Some resonances don't move at all, so that's likely to be something that's associated purely with the antenna. And some regions have completely different behavior where you can't even really predict, um, you know, or at least it's, it's very hard to tell what is causing what is causing the difference. So the point is, if, and if we if we look at the the fields again, you can see how how much of a difference there is, and especially focus on this area in the battery where you can see it's quite blue um, when the battery is disconnected, and a lot greener when the battery is connected. The point is, if you want to get usable simulation results for your antenna design, you've got to consider the the presence and the correct positioning and sizing of all the key components and all the connections between them. And then you can go and do a whole bunch of um, design studies and um, looking at the effect of different placing of antennas, looking at the effect of changing the positions or sizes of modules in parameter sweeps and so on. So yes, of course you have to simplify your model, but no, you cannot simplify it too much because the results you're going to get are not going to be relevant for your design work. Now let's move on to 5G design. So sub six gigahertz 5G design. And 
a key challenge at this frequency range is the bandwidth that we need. We need, or our objective is to have 400 megahertz of bandwidth um, centered about roughly about 3.6 gigahertz and that in a small volume. So we're looking at this 10 by 20 by two millimeter volume, this large planar area that we had. The temptation, since we need a wide bandwidth, is to go for a broadband antenna. So let's compare some options. So antenna makers can be used to design two promising looking candidates again. Like I said, these are not necessarily going to work. Well, in fact, I can guarantee, I can tell you right now that they aren't going to work because that's the point of showing them <laughs> in the first place. Um, but initially, you know, these are good starting points perhaps. Now, these on their own, they've got enormous bandwidths. So in fact, the top one, this trap monopole has actually got a band is a bandwidth uh, that is described in bandwidth ratio rather than bandwidth percentage. So, you know, th these look quite nice. The problem, of course, which is why we're showing them, is that they don't actually work. Despite the best efforts at matching using Opteni, our, one of our partner tools, um, we cannot get these antennas to give good performance across the frequency range of interest. Okay, so they, they, they simply will not work. Now let's try another option. And we're only going to show one of the several other options that we experimented with. Um, and that is, is a, a simple broadband, well, it's, in fact, it's not a, not a terribly broad, it's called a broadband, but it's not nearly as broadband as the other ones were, a simple planar inverted F antenna. So essentially it's a patch of metal con with two connectors going, well, a, a port and a separate second connector going down to the ground plane. A okay, simple PIFA. Um, and on its own, it's got a narrow bandwidth of 4.2%, but once you place it in the phone, it's, we get the much better performance than the wideband antennas. Why is this? Why does this work? And how did we actually go about designing this antenna in combination with the phone? I think the procedure is quite instructive to look at, so we will look at it. And it, there's a four stage process that we went through. First, we did the initial design at the frequency of interest. So roughly 3.6 gigahertz. Then we integrated that antenna, the standalone antenna in the phone, and we looked at its performance and matched. And let's zoom in at this stage. So you can see that the antenna resonance has shifted down from the original design frequency by about 400 megahertz or so. But very interestingly, it seems to be exciting or coupling energy into some of the structural resonances of the phone. So the, 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 the kind of the theory or the, what, what we'd like to try to do is to move this resonance up into this phone behavior region and see what happens. Hopefully we can couple more energy into the phone and make it radiate better. Okay, so let's try and do that. The redesign, with antenna megas for a 400 megahertz higher frequency. It's quite simple. It's a, it's a very straightforward operation. Please note that we're not designing for 3.6 gigahertz. That was the original design. We're actually now designing for, for about four gigahertz with the expectation that placement of the antenna is going to move that resonance back down by 400 megahertz and thus move it into the band. And lo and behold, that seems to be exactly what is happening. Let's zoom in again. Now the antenna resonance is roughly where we wanted it to be, 3.6 gigahertz. And what we see very nicely is this much stronger coupling to the phone structural resonances. So it looks like um, we might have a candidate for, for a good performance. And once we match it, again using OptaniLab, um, we get a minus 5 dB match across our 400 megahertz frequency band of interest using, again, this rather counterintuitive um, antenna, this the simple PIFA which of course is quite robust and nicely manufacturable and so on and so on. Now, I'd just like to briefly mention Opteni, our partner tool. So this was used for all the matching done for the antennas that we've seen here. And um, the, the real advantage is that you, it's easy to specify broad or multi-band um, matching um, specifications. It's also good for multi-antenna matching. So for example, for MIMO configurations, and also you're not matching for, uh, or at least you're not designing a matching circuit just for um, S11 behavior, but actually for power transmission to the antenna, which of course is extremely important if we're looking at efficiency, which is what comes on the next slide. So here's our, our result. Uh, the far field performance actually looks quite attractive. So you've got this sort of let's call it a hemi-semi-isotropic radiation pattern um, away from the user, which is very nice for, um, for SAR calculations or for the, for the human compliance testing, which will be happening later. And also the radiation efficiency is pretty good across the frequency band of interest.
So concluding this section, um, for the sub six gigahertz 5G antenna design, bandwidth here was a key challenge. We have to test a whole range of different antenna types, and it's not necessarily the, the intuitive broadband ones that are going to be the ones that work um, when you take into account the interaction with the phone. And of course, importantly, you cannot oversimplify the model. You have to have a sufficient complexity of the model in order to capture all the, the field behavior that is contributing to the radiation. We need to do extensive simulation studies to identify the best candidates. And so having an efficient model setup, and we think that Antenna Magus is a nice starting point for that, and an efficient simulation workflow where the time domain solve in particular with the hexahedral mesh, which doesn't require model simplification, is a, is a very important component as well. Now let's move on to antenna design in the millimeter wave band. And we're going to look at antenna design in the millimeter wave band for the mobile phone, even though this is not just around the corner. It is a, it is a topic which is coming up um, very shortly. And specifically for the mobile phone. Now, the aim of the, the reason for moving up to millimeter waves is that we've got a lot of bandwidth available. And this is going to hopefully facilitate high data rate communication. Now, the design goal for the mobile phone is to have full spherical coverage. That means that you have to be able to have a high gain pattern for your far field in all directions, or you know, in, in, a, in a, well, ideally over the full sphere because of the unpredictable um, nature of the person's movement and the use, how the user is using the phone and the phone's orientation relative to um, to the base station. Of course, we're thinking here about multipath effects as well. Um, so being able to switch between beams rapidly is is, a, is another uh, design goal. Having enough beams to uh, to effectively cover this full sphere. A design challenge is antenna integration. We're using essentially chip antennas in in many cases, and these are going to be integrated within the phone behind the dielectric. Um, and this is not a plug and play operation. So this is a, a, the, the main challenge that we're gonna be talking about in this section. There's also an operational challenge, and that is what is the effect of the user of the phone? If you look closely at this uh, operator here, you can see that his fingers are spread quite nicely over the back of the phone, probably obscuring some of the millimeter wave antennas that are positioned in the back. Is it still going to work? Let's see. So the first thing I'd like to do is describe our antenna. So this is um, a, sort of a concept antenna. It's not an actual, uh, you know, an actual antenna a module that you can buy. Um, it's basically a two by two array of stack, uh, a two by two array of stacked patch antennas, dual polarization. Um, and there's there's a bunch of different layers involved here. One of the reasons for moving to chip antennas is that we, we can include the power distribution network in the chip. So if, if you have at 28 gigahertz, if you have the power distribution network in standard PCB, so for example, let's say FR4 technology, or strip line technology in FR4, you've got pretty high insertion losses, about 0.12 dB per millimeter for strip line in FR4. And of course, that's further exacerbated by surface roughness, which is not something we're going to talk about in detail here, but which is a very important topic um, when we get to millimeter wave frequencies. Um, so the idea is to kind of avoid this by integrating um, the, the power distribution network in the chip directly. So we, we have our chip and we're gonna try and place it over here in our phone. Um, and we see, you know, without a cover, everything looks great. We've got a nice radiation pattern. But if we add the plastic cover, everything does not look so great anymore. The pattern looks quite different and we don't have a, a, a nicely performing antenna at all. That's for a plastic cover. What happens if you add a glass cover? What happens if you add a metal cover? Is it going to work at all? So these are, these are questions that I'm going to talk about right now. But let's first look at the fields because I think it's really instructive to kind of start understanding what is going on. Let's, we can start by visualizing the electric field at 28 gigahertz. The array is roughly here. Well, it's exactly here, in fact. And you can see that it radiates a lot of energy out on bore site in the intended direction. But quite a lot of energy is reflected. And you can see that sort of standing wave effect 
over there between the antenna and this plastic layer there's a there's sort of a standing wave which is due to the reflection you can also see at these frequencies the dielectric actually becomes quite thick electrically speaking um, and it starts acting as a sort of a dielectric waveguide which is guiding energy away to other parts of the phone and then it's re-radiating from discontinuities like the the ends or the corners Okay, so there are quite a lot of unpredictable effects, and these are adding up to give that sort of strange rippled radiation pattern that we just saw before. So let's simplify the problem a bit to understand better what's going on. If we take a sheet of plastic, same thickness, same properties as the cover, we expose it to a plane wave, we can see how the reflection is dependent on the frequency and the angle of incidence. Okay, so frequency on the horizontal axis, angle of incidence on the vertical. In the sub six gigahertz range, we get quite a, a, a weak reflection, so good transmission, right up to about 60 degree scan angle across the entire band. In the millimeter wave frequency band, and again, we're looking at about 24, 25 to 28 gigahertz I've, I've marked on the plot here. The best we can do is a reflection of about minus seven dB or so. Right, so we're not even, it's its clearly not transparent at all um, in, you know, for any of any angle of incidence and any, and any of the frequencies in this higher millimeter wave band. And actually, if we, if, if we generalize this to look at a dielectric layer with a permittivity, with a thickness, we can, we can plot the transmission versus the thickness in wavelengths as this kind of wavy line. So you can you can actually predict this analytically um, and you get perfect transmission for zero thickness, of course, but actually it's a periodic effect. So every half a wavelength, you get good transmission. Every quarter of a wavelength, so also every, every half wavelength, but starting at a quarter roughly, um, you get quite poor transmission. Now, unfortunately, our if we look at this orange bar, this is the two millimeter thickness of our dielectric cover of our of our phone. It falls exactly into this trough in transmission. So we have two options. We could try and make it thinner, moving it to um, the green region here. So this green bar, we'd have to make it about 600 micrometers thick. And of course that would have some pretty serious negative mechanical implications. We could also try and make it thicker, moving it up to half a wavelength, but then you've got quite a fat um, dielectric on your phone and that's not going to be attractive or nice to carry or even that light potentially. So the, neither of these are very attractive options. So what else can we do? Well, we can experiment with different material properties as well. So the curve on the left is for optimal transmission, we're looking at how the thickness varies for different materials. So we have ABS, this plastic at the top, we've got in the, the red curve, we've got the blue curve, which is glass with a higher permittivity, and then we've got aluminum oxide, the green curve at the bottom. And you can see firstly that the the thick, the, the, the lower your permittivity is, the thicker the dielectric that you need, and also, um, if, if you have a higher permittivity, you need a, a smaller variation of thickness to achieve different scanning angles. On the right, you can see um, the optimum permittivity for different thicknesses. So if you've got a target thickness of one millimeter for your, for your back of your phone, then you need, an, ideally, you need a permittivity of about 29, <laughs> which is massive. If you go down to two millimeters, permittivity of about six or seven, which brings us back to glass, because glass actually seems to be a really attractive material. And that is actually exactly the material that is used in high-end phones. So what happens if we put glass on the back of our phone? The ideally, for optimal transmission, we need a thickness of about two millimeters, as we saw just on the previous slide, roughly 2.05 on bore site. The standard glass thickness is a bit thinner than this, 0.77 millimeters. So the idea that we have here is to try and thicken locally the radome or the, the, um, the, the, the back plate of the phone in order to get better transmission. And this seems to actually work quite nicely. So even though the far fields look pretty similar for the non-lensed antenna and the lensed antenna, if you look at the return loss, you can see that the lens has a huge effect. It, it, it makes the antenna much more efficient. And you can also see this in the total radiation efficiency on the right. The lens also gives us a nicer performance when we're scanning. So you can see a much sort of an in inverted commas cleaner beam when we scan to 30 degrees. So glass seems to be quite a nice option, <clears throat> but we'd need to do some work on the, 
on at least you know if, if we have to have a dielectric back we could probably get glass to work quite well um, as when when we're integrating millimeter wave antennas behind it now let's go on to something a bit more challenging and that is a metal backed design so the big you know this is a potentially quite an attractive material for phone cases you can see um, a couple of generations ago high-end phones of course did have metal backs they had slots in them potentially which are marked here by red in this configuration of our demo um, so non-conductive regions which kind of maybe provided electromagnetic windows for the antennas behind them or maybe isolated parts of the metal housing so that they could act as an antenna so there are different approaches that could be used um, but what's how can is it possible to integrate millimeter wave antennas in metal backed phones and here we thought of trying an approach which is used quite a lot in the, in the aerospace and defense industry for, cover, for, for um, making ray domes frequency selective, so giving them frequency selective performance. And that is integrating a periodic array of some kind of inclusion, some kind of structure. So in this case, it's metal integrated in a, in a dielectric, but you can do it the other way around as well. Integrating this in the housing in order to allow energy to pass at some frequencies and stop energy at other frequencies to keep the shielding effect. And actually, if you're interested, on our website, and this, this, uh, the title of this little window here, when you download the presentation, um, once it's uploaded, maybe in the next few days, um, there, there's a hyperlink there that'll take you to this application note, which describes the design of a frequency selective surface and how it works. So if you're interested in this, in this, uh, this topic, you're welcome to go and have a look at that. Anyway, the question is, can we apply these techniques, so allowing fields to pass in the band of interest by having these little inclusions to our metal-backed phone? So what we're going to try and do is in the in the phone we're going to try and have include regions of dielectric these rings of dielectric and we, we can achieve those rings by using some kind of um, oxidation process and so and what, what actually ends up happening well firstly the dielectric is has quite a high permittivity so it's some kind of oxide material with a with a permittivity of about nine but even the metallic regions have been etched away slightly or oxidized away slightly and the metallic regions that we see are also actually a layering of dielectric with a thin metal inclusion and then another layer of dielectric. Some, this is called a loaded radome in, in radome design. Um, but anyways, so this is the, the top view and the side view or the, or the plan view of our, of our proposed structure. And in order to optimize this, we, 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 go and we don't look at the whole frequency selective surface, but we look at a unit cell of this. So one element with uh, uh, little bits of the surrounding elements as well. And we try and optimize this to have a reflection of better than minus 10 dB, so smaller than minus 10 dB, in the frequency range of interest and simultaneously over the scanning range of interest. If you're interested in this topic, this was also described in a lot of detail in a webinar that we did about, well, three years ago now, about FSS and polarizer design. And so, again, this is a hyperlinkable uh, little screenshot that you can uh, just click on when you download the presentation later on. Now, if we do this optimization, you can see that uh, we get quite a good performance, or, or at least we, we, get, we get a good reflection performance um, but in our frequency range of interest up to about 40 degrees. So for both polarizations of the, of the electric field. So, so blue is good in this case, of course. If we then, you know, one of the topics that we're, that are, is of interest or one of the things we have to pay attention to is that we're actually implementing very small dimensions of the structure. You know, so all of these, the, the, the rings, if you noticed a moment ago, they were like one millimeter in size. The little gaps were 0.1 or 0.2 millimeters in size. So we've got sub-millimeter dimensions. And that means that manufacturing tolerances are something to be taken into account. So what we've done here is done a parameter sweep over a five micrometer tolerance of the thickness of the metal, the diameter of the rings, the width of the rings. And we've then overlaid all the results. And you can see the around the nominal blue curves on the left, so this blue one here, you can see the spread. And, at the, and we've just kind of marked the spread at the low nominal frequency and the high nominal frequency. You can see that there's a spread of about a gigahertz on each side. So in the worst case, our bandwidth could be reduced from four um, gigahertz down to two gigahertz if everything goes and kind of in an un, unfortunate way. <laughs> um, and of course, there's also a big spread in the, in the loss in each case. So we might 
quite easily have something have a have a have a frequency selective surface which is not working so well. So it's just a, this is the sort of analysis you can do to make sure that your design is going to be robust um, to manufacturing tolerances as well. So then what the the next um, step is of course to integrate the frequency selective surface in the phone. And the first question we'd like to answer is do we need to cover the whole phone or how big should this frequency selective surface region actually be? And before we continue, I'd like to just draw your attention to, and this is something we found while doing research for this, uh, for this uh, presentation. There is actually a patent application which deals with a very similar approach um, in, in mobile phone cover design. And it's probably worth having a look at if you're, if you're thinking about doing work in this region. Anyway, what we're interested in is how big this frequency selective surface region should be. Do we need to cover the whole phone or can we just put a small window, a large window, a medium sized window? What, what, ex what extent of the, how big, what's the influence of the window size on the antenna performance? And we can see that actually it looks like from the 3D radiation patterns at least, it looks like there's not much of an influence and you can get away with having quite a small window behind it. That's confirmed by looking at a, a polar plot in this particular plane of the, of the main beam steered to, um, to broadside, so to zero or straight out of the, the face of the phone. And even if we scan to 30 degrees, the performance is very similar depend, you know, for, for the different window sizes. So we can basically get away with the, the small windows, the conclusion. Matching performance is also pretty good for all the window sizes. Um, so it looks like we have an antenna which, which works quite nicely. Um, and we could actually add a second antenna as well um, if we wanted to, to provide better coverage. But now the question is, what is the benefit of doing this? What's the benefit? Is there a benefit of having two arrays rather than one array? What if we actually added even some more arrays? So, so if the, the, at, at 28 gigahertz, the width of the phone is high enough to be able to integrate slot arrays. Not something I've showed in detail here, but we've done some design or some initial designs to, to integrate slot arrays in the side of the phone. And that seems to be quite a promising approach as well. But the answer is, or the question is, how many of these arrays do we actually need to provide the performance that we want? And what is actually good performance anyway? And to answer these questions, I'd like to now turn to the material provided very generously by our customers, Kun Zhao and Jinong Ying from Sony Mobile Communications. And I should first point out very clearly that all the material provided by Sony is related to mock-ups, to prototyping, to simulation. None of the material shown here is related at all to any commercial phone. But the question is, what criteria do we want to use to evaluate the quality of the antenna solution? How do we get from you know, the, the different configurations, maybe questions about phone materials and number position of the arrays, to that number which tells us, yes, this is a design that meets specification or no, it's not. Okay, and so in green, there are two configurations or there are two configurations here which meet the requirement we'll be introduced to in a moment. Um, and that is, and the, the key uh, expression here is the effect of isotropic radiated power at a cumulative distribution function of 50%. So let's see what this means. <clears throat> First of all, we have an antenna module in our phone. It supports a number of beams configurations, in this case six. We activate each of the beams in turn and check in which direction, or, or check in across the sphere what the maximum um, uh, effective isotropic radiated power is in all directions. That's the total ERP pattern. This total ERP pattern we convert to a cumulative distribution function. So when we look at this beam in this hypothetical case, in 50% of the, so over 50% of the solid sphere, we've got an ERP of better than or, or equal to 10.5 dBm. Okay, CDF, by the way, that's cumulative distribution function, just in case um, you didn't know. Now, this 50% CDF is an important quantity because that's one of the 3GPP specifications. So there, there are two of them. One of them is the peak value. So the, so the, the a, a total EIRP should, in some direction, at least be 22.4 dBm. So that's this maximum quantity over here. And the minimum ERP at the 50th percentile 
should be 11.5 across the across three of the operating bands and eight across another. Please note that these are single band um, specifications. A multi-band specification has been agreed just last week, but it's not actually included in the standard just yet. So in our actual Sony demo model here, which has a glass back cover, a two by two patch array operating at 28 gigahertz, a metal bezel, we have these five supported beams. We can convert this to one total ERP pattern, which looks like this in 3D. We can also project that onto a, or map it onto a 2D plane. So you can see the, the five supported beams here quite nicely. And if you then convert this to a cumulative distribution function, you get to an ERP, 50 percentile ERP, uh, CDF EIRP, uh, at a, sorry, 50th percentile CDF at an ERP level of 10 dBm. Um, which doesn't meet our specification of 11.5. So if we add a second array on the back of the phone, well, now we've got a ERP, or we've got this 50, 0.5 CDF at an ERP of 15. So this does seem to meet our specification. So this is a maybe, you know, this is a way of directly comparing these two configurations. And we can do far more extensive studies as well. So for example, here's, um, here, here there are seven different studies that were done looking at different display configuration, different numbers of antenna panels on the front or the back, comparing different phone frame materials and back cover materials. And you can see that for this, this CDF 0.5, which is this blue dotted line here, four of the different configurations beat that specification. So these four over here, and the best one is this double side panel with glass back cover. Now again, please note this is not related to any real phone. This is a, a hypothetical test case. So you know we, we're not making any statement on how phones should be configured to provide optimal um, performance. So concluding for the millimeter wave 5G antenna design question, integration is the challenge here really. Um, at these frequencies, thin materials become electrically thick. And so we need to start thinking of them as radomes and using radome design techniques um, to, in order to design the phone housing in such a way as to accommodate the antennas. This is an, an approach, of, there might be other approaches as well. And finally, um, we do need quite specific post-processing in order to evaluate the antenna performance. And this is busy being defined um, right now. And, and some of the initial um, thoughts were shown um, during this last section. Now, the final section is human exposure. And the, the picture that I'm showing here, as we'll see on the next slide, is actually a plane wave at 28 gigahertz impacting on the person's head. Now, what's interesting about this is that the field penetration into the person is very low, right? So what the, the approach that we used um, in at, at, at sub six gigahertz, which we'll show in a moment, is to evaluate the specific absorption rate inside the head. This is not going to work at 28 gigahertz because there's not much power inside the person. So what is thought of instead is to consider the power flow in planes a certain distance from the phone and we'll get to that in a few minutes. For the sub six gigahertz models, of course, we're interested in the usual, um, the, the, the kind of existing SAR standards are applicable. We have field penetration into the human and we have to model the specific absorption rate. Now, as a standard component of CST Studio Suite, we do have a number of biological models which are actually used right now in um, simula simulative compliance testing. So there's the SAM Phantom at right, this comes with a CTIA hand and with a CTIA spacer. New in version 2019, which is released, I think, this week or next week. And we have an auto gripping hand. So this comes in three different configurations for different sizes of phone. And basically, um, if you position the local coordinate system at the bottom back left of the phone, then the hand will automatically open. You, you run the macro, sorry, you run the macro. Then the hand automatically opens and closes again until it touches the phone. And then you can uh, run your simulations. Okay, as I said, in the sub six gigahertz frequency range, standard SAR regulations apply. So if we have this antenna that is radiating, um, we can see the electric fields and the SAR, the specific absorption rate on the surface of the person. If we look inside, you can see the fields penetrating, well, nicely is probably the wrong word, <laughs> penetrating, not alarmingly, but penetrating nonetheless into the person's head um, and giving some kind of heating effect, which is quantified by the specific absorption rate, which in this case, um, for the this is averaged over one gram 
if we look at the averaging over 10 grams, which is one of the standards, we can see that the maximum is 0.1 watts per kilogram in this case, which is well below the legal limit of one watt per kilogram. Also, you can also visualize in which region of the head. So this red cube tells you which part of the uh, head was taken to average the fields. Okay, so this is kind of standard specific absorption rate analysis. Where it gets kind of more interesting maybe or more challenging is at 28 gigahertz. How do we model the human body at these frequencies? This blue, the blue block that you can see in the middle shows the wavelength relative to the, the big open hand in the background at 28 gigahertz, it's 17 millimeters. Inside the body, because of the high dielectric constant, the wavelength reduces to 1.7 millimeters. So the 1.7 meter high person at the right is actually a thousand wavelengths in size. Now, luckily, as we saw, we're not interested in fields inside the body. We're interested in fields outside the body. So a very um, efficient approach is to actually not model the fields inside, but rather focus on the exterior of the body. And that saves us a huge amount of simulation effort, as we'll see in a minute. Now, one of the topics of interest is to actually consider different usage scenarios. And I'd like to just, I know that we are kind of running, you know, we haven't got that much time left and I won't take much more of your time if I haven't got much longer to go. But I wanted to show you a very interesting tool which is called Cartier Human Design. So it's an, it's an app that is native to the 3D Experience platform and it allows you to configure different people in different postures, also with relation to devices. So for example, the mobile phone you import, you have the person grab the phone, the fingers wrap automatically around it, then you can change the posture of the person and the phone together before exporting the person and importing them into CST Studio Suite. Now once they're in CST Studio Suite, we can assign material properties to them. We can also import our phone model again, and we can use the system assembly modeling framework to align the two with each other in the correct way. So here, for example, we're first fixing the person in place, we're selecting the phone, and then we're using the anchor point on the phone to align the phone with another anchor point on the person. It automatically snaps into place. We can use the tab and shift tab keys to make sure that the orientation is correct. And we now have our, our geometric um, definition of the system um, set up so that we can start doing the simulations that we need to do in order to quantify the performance um, of the of the of the antennas in the proximity of the human. And the way that we do that, so coming to how to actually simulate this, is in stages. We use a hybrid solution or a hybrid approach. We first simulate the 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 cell the the antenna in the phone with part of the hand and that part of the hand is automatically extracted for you know hybrid simulation workflow we first simulate that using a time domain solver then we record a near field source around the phone equivalent source and place this again automatically it's placed for you in fact on the person in the right location um, and we use another solver to, so it could again be the time domain solver, but with a coarser mesh this time, because we're not having to consider the fine details of the phone or a surface-based approach like the integral equation or asymptotic solver to get the performance of the phone around the person. Now, the, 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 what the hybrid workflow here is actually doing is hiding the fine details of the phone from the huge thousand wavelength simulation um, to understand the, the, the fields around the person as a whole. It's hiding the fine detail. That's, that's really all it's doing. Now, if you look at the effect of, or the difference between having the antenna in the phone on its own to the effect of the hand, to the effect of the user, you can see that actually in all cases, it seems to work pretty well because we're radiating away from the person and we don't have any fingers in the way. The, the, the field pattern gets a bit more complex and you can see some, some reflections and lobes of the far field radiating in different directions. You can see there's something, some energy going backwards here in this case, and there's a shielding effect of the human, which is evident, it would be more evident if I rotated the person around. But the antenna seems to work quite well for this particular scan in this particular configuration. What happens if I partially cover the array? So I'm, now I'm holding my phone in a different way on the left. I'm partially covering, covering the millimeter wave, uh, the little chip array. What's the effect on performance? Well, again, because we have this quite efficient workflow to set this up, it's really quite easy to do the study. And the answer is, 
still works. <laughs> there is a modification um, to, the, to the pattern, as you can see here, but you've still got a good gain in roughly the right direction. And actually, even partially obscuring the, the, the array doesn't, doesn't interrupt its behavior too much. Now, there's another topic, the last topic, um, and this again, I'd like to thank our Sony um, colleagues or cu customers here for, for um, providing us with this material. Um, and that is that, of course, we're not interested in specific absorption rate, but we still want to understand um, how well or, or you know, th there are going to be some compliance issues related to how much power is coming out of the phone. And the idea is to, rather than to, to look at the fields in the person, the idea is just to look at the power flow from the device in these 30 centimeter wide planes at a two centimeter distance. Again, we, we don't want to mesh this entire space in a, with a volumetric mesh and run it all in a time domain solver or a FEM type solver. What we'd rather do is record an equivalent near field source. So run the time domain solver just for the volume around the immediate, immediately around the, the demo phone. And then to run a surface-based um, simulation, for example, with the integral equation solver to calculate the fields on these planes. And what we get then is the power flow at this two centimeter distance. It could also be one centimeter or 0.5 centimeter. So these uh, standards are still in, in discussion at the moment. So this is a quite a nice, efficient workflow. Once the standards have been established, this will be a really good approach to being able to, to quantify um, your, you know, or quantify how, how your phone is going to do in the certification tests. So this hybrid solution is quite, quite a nice way of, of, of doing it. Right, that brings me then to the conclusion. Um, what is the promise of 5G was our initial question. Um, and so, you know, basically, high, 5G is upon us. <laughs> we are going, you know, high data rate, low latency communication is going to be coming soon to a phone near you. And in fact, it's going to be coming soon to your next phone or the, perhaps the one after next, depending on how often you update. Antenna design is a key enabling technology to make 5G work. If you've got bad antennas, you're not going to have this high data rate and low latency communication. Antennas are absolutely critical. Antennas are not just about performance, they're about balancing performance and safety compliance. And what that means is that you have to accurately model both the phone and the user in all the frequency ranges um, that are of interest to you. And finally, you know, we've seen that 5G antenna design can be pretty challenging, but we hope and we believe, in fact, <laughs> that these challenges can be overcome if you're using the right tools. And of course, the right tools, in our opinion, are the advanced simulation tools provided by Dassault System. So thank you very much. And I'd like to hand back to Stephen for the Q&A at this point. <laughs>